But the season was headed for a showdown because the penultimate game would be versus Aurora, which carried a two-year undefeated streak through the season. And they had future college Hall of Famer Tom Curtis at quarterback. It was everything a fan could hope to see. An all-state quarterback on one team and the two fastest running backs in Ohio on the other. Played in Aurora on a Saturday afternoon on a rock-strewn field with Route 82 only a couple yards behind the end zone. The Green Men came onto the field with the words, Beat Windows, tattooed with electrician's tape on every single helmet. Aurora held Wyndham to minus yardage in the first quarter, and Curtis hit halfback Jeff Jewett with a 10-yard scoring pass in the second. The Bombers immediately retaliated with the drive culminating with Alan Todd bootlegging the ball for the final yards. The rest of the game was deadlocked, with the Bombers battering the Greenies but being turned away at the end zone twice. Ray Ruff sprinted 41 yards on a breakaway, but lost the ball on the one-yard line to a vicious tackle. The Bombers drove the field in the last minute of play, but Curtis, who had been outplayed by Alan Cott, intercepted the last pass in the end zone to end the game. It was a game for the ages, which made it almost criminal that Wyndham lost. Aurora had made their extra points, and the Bombers had. A final game against Garrettsville couldn't remove the bitter taste of a second consecutive bridesmaid spot in the PCL. And Leo Cott didn't know if he could go through it one more time. He would lose Ray Ruff, Larry Barker, Arnie Kessling, Pete Bennett, plus reliable linemen like Don Henley, Eddie Qualls, Harry Purdy, Joey Cabbage, and more. And he wasn't sure that what was left would be good enough. Wyndham was changing in 1966. Will Sands had served a short stint as mayor to be replaced by the ubiquitous Cy Smith. And Leo Cott was changing. Over the last couple seasons, he had seemed unusually tired. He retired from coaching basketball because of it. Wyndham dropped the baseball team that spring, relieving him of another duty, although he took on the job as the head golf coach, which was at least more relaxing, since the coaches got to play each other while their team competed. I know this, I was a golf coach. That's the only reason I did Leo was coming to rely more on his assistants, who he'd molded in his image. Jim Berger was one of his own, graduating in 1961, playing four years at St. Olaf College, and coming home to teach. John Lowry, the terrifying ex-Marine, who many thought played bad cop to Leo's good cop, had been toned down, and some might even say civilized, <laughs> By Leo's understanding of the psychology it took to get 11 teenagers to work together as a team. Because whatever else I have said in this talk, these were teenagers volunteering to break their bodies in a black and gold uniform. Leo worked as hard as ever. He was obsessively organized like his idol, Woody Hayes. He instinctively knew what would work with any combination of athletes, and that's how he pulled together his practice plans. His assistants hated his conferences, always held in the tiny coach's cubicle in the corner of the locker room. The air blew with the smoke from Leo's omnipresent Chesterfield cigarettes. <laughs> Leo sitting on the throne wearing only an athletic supporter. <laughs> <laughs> the ladies didn't know that, did you? <laughs> this was a study that the players knew well. But as the 1966 season approached, 
approached. Leo had thoughts which he shared with absolutely none of his staff or players. But the first order of business was to remold the line. He had three year starters, George Belden and Tim Stom at tackle, and Ed Bill Hall as the nucleus, but everybody else was new. Speedy Dave Pauls could man the other end position. Two seniors, Jim Summinger and Duke Bonnet, and junior Jeff Mayer, had to fill the all important interior of the line. Now, Bonnet was a nasty blocker that no one wanted to face in drills. And Mayer was a fire club just built to play guard. And then Jim Sullinger was the question mark. He had played center since Pee Wee, but he had no special talent other than extraordinary toughness. The lightest boy on the line, he had to come through if quarterback Allen caught was going to succeed. Now, Cott and Ruff were certainties in the backfield, but the rest of the, ro the running backs would be a rotating circus. Ozzie Pipson had been a star in the Pee Wees, and Larry Steiner, despite a propensity to scamper around in the backfield for 15 seconds, darting from sideline to sideline in order to gain maybe three yards. <laughs> would see a lot of playing time. The other running back, Arthur Judy Jones, was so bow-legged that he could straddle oncoming tackles. <laughs> Leo, was, Leo was fielding a team with only one underclassman, but most of those seniors had never been starters. So when he told the record courier before the season, that you can't lose 12 good boys to graduation and expect too much. He might have been telling the truth, although assistant coach John Lowry believes that in his heart of hearts, Leo thought he might pull one last one out of the hat. 